Good. It's noon um, Eastern time, and uh, this is Jerry Barron from uh, IR4 Project Headquarters. And I would like to welcome you to the fourth in our series of virtual crop tours. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this in, in a minute or so. Uh, but I believe we've had one little change in, in um, uh, process and uh, opening up some welcome remarks uh, will be uh, uh, Mike Goodis from EPA. Ed, Ed uh, uh, Messina won't be able to join us today. Uh, so Mike, if you're out there, I, I hope you're there. Mike, uh, you'd like to say some welcome words of, uh, of inspiration this morning? <laughs> sure, thanks. I'll try to be uh, inspirational. I don't know, that's a, that's a tough challenge for me, but thanks, Jerry. Um, first off, I wanna thank uh, the RF4 for hosting another virtual crop tour, uh, this one on hops. And we all know the importance of hops, right? So um, uh, really looking forward to this one. Um, I know we've enjoyed uh, earlier sessions on cranberries and hemp and coffee and, and looking forward to uh, similar events such as these um, uh, going forward. Um, I really appreciate the time and effort that uh, IR4 and its partners put into these uh, virtual crop tours. Um, again, they're, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is a great way to, um, uh, to reach out uh, to uh, as many people as possible in, in order to uh, observe uh, the issues regarding agriculture and, and our role in EPA in making uh, regulatory decisions regarding pesticides. Um, hops is particularly of, of interest to me. I've, I've um, not just for how, why it's used, um, but I did have an opportunity some years back, about four or five years ago, to visit uh, Yakima Valley and observe uh, the, the hops industry and, and attend uh, uh, a, a conference regarding uh, hops growing and the challenges um, uh, associated with the agriculture and then in particular the, the trade issues around it as well. Uh, it's a fascinating um, uh fascinating industry, especially when you look at the uh, uh, really the emergence of all kinds of specialty hops and the issues regarding uh, and challenges regarding trade uh, across the globe, um, uh, both, uh, you know, uh, exporting from the U.S. and also importing from other areas as well. It's uh, really a fascinating industry. Um, but uh, in particular, I like to take um, uh, a moment here to recognize the contributions of, of Ann George, who uh, I was not aware until recently and will be uh, retiring soon. Um, uh, I've gotten known Ann over the years. I mean, she's been a strong advocate for the, the hops industry, working with the uh, Hop Growers of America. Uh, has been a strong partner uh, working with EPA and, and working towards uh, 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 getting uh, uh, pesticides uh, reg um, registered for use on hops and, and also dealing with uh, a number of the MRL and trade issues around them, around them as well. So um, uh, thanks for all your, uh, your work and your partnership with EPA. Uh, certainly uh, encourage you to enjoy, enjoy your retirement. And we're certainly looking forward to uh, a good working relationship with the Hop Growers of America uh, with Maggie Elliott in the future. So uh, with that, um, uh, Jerry, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Mike, for, for that inspirational comments. So uh, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, well, you know, it, it's one of the, the uh, downsides of going second is uh, sometimes the person in front of you make some of your same comments. So, so bear with me because there are some things that Mike said that I'd like to uh, repeat again, but uh, this is uh, our uh, fourth virtual tour. Uh, we started this uh, when COVID first hit as a substitute for our legacy bus tours of Mid-Atlantic region. Um, we've been able to take this opportunity that we are doing it virtually to see crops they're sometimes difficult to see. So our, our last tour, we um, involved coffee. So we had folks from Puerto Rico and Hawaii that were engaged in, and was able to bring some of the pest management issues and some of the 
um, you know, real tough problems to, to the attention of EPA. So, uh, you know, we've taken this opportunity to, to spread out a little bit what things that we can't see in uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic. Uh, now, I guess you can see hops in the Mid-Atlantic because hops are grown so many places now because of the rapid growth of the um, uh, microbreweries and the local breweries. But uh, it is one of my favorite specialty crops. And I'm sure there's many on this call that feel the same way. Uh, but let me be the first to share this catchphrase that the hop community uses when they're talking about IR4. And it's plain and simple, no IR4, no IPA. Um, this, this term, I, I'll, I'll give her credit, but it really was uh, coined from uh, Ann George uh, 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 during a meeting that uh, she attended uh, uh, when we went over to Congress to talk about IR4. Um, in the past three decades, Ann has helped IR4 in so many ways, both on the technical end as well as support for funding. Uh, let me share with you that, uh, you know, the extent of Ann's reach. At one point, fresh hops was considered a raw agriculture commodity and dry hops was a process commodity. Prior to FQPA, the Delaney cause restricted many pesticide uses on hops because the Delaney clause, for those who've been around for a while, remember that one, it was a true hazard assessment. And single-handedly got Congress to declare dried hops as the raw agriculture commodity. And as people like to say, the rest is history. As Mike indicated, Ann is retiring this year. Uh, IR4 recently awarded Ann with the SOAR award for all the support she's provided. Uh, to us and shared with anyone who would listen about the importance of IR4. So we, we sincerely thank Anne and, uh, and what she's done for the hops industry and, and wish her all the best. There's so many people to acknowledge and uh, thank in putting these tours together, uh, especially, you know, the group at IR4 headquarters. They do so much behind the scenes to, to make this happen. I do want to give a special shout out to, to Van Starner, who's been involved in these tours, the in-person tours and now the virtual tours for at least 20 years. Van retired from IR4 December uh, 2019, but still works part-time with us to help on these tours and other tasks. Uh, last month, Van informed me this would be his last tour. Um, that's of course, we don't go to Adams County, Pennsylvania, where his family still lives in farms. And I'm sure Van would be interested if we went back there to jump on the bandwagon and be part of it again. Uh, Van, what would these tours be without you? Well, I guess we're gonna find out in the future, but I just really wanna thank you for all you've done over the years to help share your knowledge and passion about special crop agriculture with our partners in EPA and helping the process of uh, bringing this knowledge to, you know, places where it can be used. Uh, and I will now would like to end uh, my initial comments and turn it over to, to Maggie Elliott, uh, one of the newest members of the IR4 Commodity uh, Liaison Committee, um, who's rapidly learning and thriving with all the activities formerly managed by Ann. So Maggie, we have complete, complete confidence that you'll do a fantastic job. And let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Jerry, for those warm comments. I'll also note, so hello everyone, my name is Maggie Elliott. I'm the new girl with Hop Growers America, currently serving as the Science and Communications Director. I don't think that Anne's on the call right now, but I will make sure to pass on all of your really warm regards to her. I, this was, uh, IR4 was a really meaningful, meaningful part of her career. And um, I, you can um, be sure that I am trying to absorb all of her knowledge as she transitions to retirement. And so today I'm here to deliver a hop industry overview um, for you all today. It's really remarkable to think that that beautiful little cone that you see on the screen, that cone is the distinguishing factor between fermented barley water and beer. The unique resin profile of the hop cone is the only substance known to man that can contribute the distinct bittering and flavoring, flavoring components that makes beer, beer. 
Without hops, we can't have beer. And so today we're here to share with you some of the challenges of the unique, the unique challenges that are associated with growing hops. Before we dive into the specifics of different pest control management strategies, I'm here to share with you uh, a little bit of context, overarching context about the hop industry. So the hop industry is a very concentrated industry. In the entirety of the United States, it, there's about 62,000 acres of, of hops grown. It's very much considered a specialty crop. However, those 62,000 acres yield a world presence as right now the United States contributes about 40% of the entire world supply, which makes us the largest producer in the world. Now, another very interesting layer to this production scheme is that the Pacific Northwest states of Washington, Idaho, and Oregon account for 98% of total US production. We'll talk about a little bit more of the specifics about why that happens later. It's also interesting to note that there's a large diversity of hops, different varieties of hops grown. We grow over 60 different varieties. However, there are a number of hops that are very popular right now in the brewing sector. And so our top 10 varieties actually account for almost 70% of our entire acreage. So let's take a step back and look at some of the world hop production statistics. You'll see that there are really two main world players on the stage right now, and that is the United States at about 40% of world production and also Germany. The rest of the world combines um, is about 22% uh, collectively. Um, and so what you'll see is that while you see these two large countries dominate the world stage, it also opens the door for us to have collaborative partnerships, collaborative long-standing partnerships um, with these um, industries abroad. We'll touch on some of our collaborative efforts a little bit later. Another interesting piece to this is that there are a lot of, even in the world sector, seeing how, how defined some of these areas are, um, there are really two areas of the world that really account for a lot of acreage and production, that being the Yakima Valley in Washington states, which accounts for about 73% of US production, and then the Hallertau region in Germany, which accounts for the vast production in Germany. You can imagine that when something happens to either of those two growing regions, it completely skews the entire market, which helps contribute to hops being um, a very traditionally a very volatile market. And it also opens the door for just for long standing partnerships to be able to navigate around those measures. Something that's very unique about this industry is that it has undergone a seismic shift in the last 10 years because of the craft brewing industry. The emergence of the craft brewing industry, next slide please. The emergence of the craft, oh, excuse me. You might step back and think, what's so special about these two growing regions? So you see that, that Germany and the United States account for a large proportion of the hops. In the United States, we know that 98% of the hops come from just the Pacific Northwest. So you might be sitting back and thinking, what it really is so unique, so special, so distinct about the Pacific Northwest. And one of the key aspects of this is that hop yield is conducive to day length. Hops really need to soak in the sun um, during a very specific part of its growing season so that it can grow tall. Hops grow about 18 feet tall on those trellises. Um, and so, for instance, here in the Yakima Valley, our longest day, we get about 17 hours and 27 minutes of day length. And so when you, you'll see that the growing regions of the Pacific Northwest really hug around the 45th parallel. It's the northern enough latitude that they get those long summer days to yield well. But a really core piece of our ability to grow hops well in this region resides in the fact that we grow it in a dry climate. You'll hear later about how susceptible hops are to mildew and fungus, and having a dry climate is very crucial to alleviating some of those pest pressures. The other part of that, the balancing factor is that hops need water to grow. And so our growing regions have access to irrigation coming from snowpack, mountain snowpack, that we're able to irrigate enough for hops to grow very well. Another interesting piece is that mature hops thrive in heat. Now a key part of this is mature hops. We did have a heat dome uh, slam through the Pacific Northwest last year. Uh, in June, that's a little earlier than normal that did impact our yield. However, mature hops, 
they can thrive in temperatures over 100 degrees. So in some of our growing regions that are considered high desert areas that routinely clock in at over 100 degrees in the summer, um, hops doesn't face hops, hops can thrive in the heat. Hops also require a rather specific soil profile. They need deep, loose, well-drained soil. That's something that our growing regions are able to present to them. And another thing, another interesting piece is that in the Pacific Northwest, some it hosts growing regions where it's the only place in the world where growers can plant cuttings in the spring and expect a full harvest in autumn. In a lot of different areas, growing areas for hops around the world, you need an entire year to help uh, nourish the growth of the plant before you can expect anything much of a yield. But in a growing area such as the Yakima Valley, uh, they grow enough in the very first year to be able to merit a harvest. Um, and that's something that can really help get our producers ahead in the world scene. Next slide, please. And so the hop industry has undergone a seismic shift because of the emergence of the craft brewing era. And the popularity of hop forward beers have dramatically increased demand. I've, I've had people ask me now, since, since the craft brewing sector, relatively speaking, might only constitute 15%, maybe 20% of beer volume consumed in the United States, how is, how is this, how is the small craft brewing sector have such an outsized impact on the hop industry? And the answer is that craft beer uses a lot more hops than more of the industrial uh, style brewed lagers that are very popular, such as Budweiser or Miller Coors. Um, so generally speaking, now craft beer uses about 5.6 times more hops than those industrial than those industrial brew brewed beers. Now, of course, an IPA will use more hops than a pale ale. However, generally speaking, craft beer uses 5.6 times more hops. So that has spurred an incredible demand in, in growth. Our acreage has doubled in the last 10 years. Um, and a key point to this is that American craft brewers generally purchase US hops. So while we're seeing this surge in demand, craft brewers in the United States need hops, they're pulling them from US hops, which has really helped the acceleration of this industry. It's also shifted the paradigm of the US history, of the US industry in many notable ways. One of them being the balance of what we call, of the two primary cultivars that we grow, two types of cultivars, which is aroma hops and alpha hops. Now, alpha hops are generally categorized as the type of hops that contribute the bittering component to brewing, while the aroma hops are the type of hops that you would think that would contribute the pineapple flavors, the citrus flavors, you know, the specialty, more of the specialty crops um, that are high in demand for craft brewing. Back in the day, uh, we grew about a, a very even balance, about 50% alpha, 50% aroma. Today, we grow 80% aroma, 20% alpha. That's one indicator of just what the demand of the brewing industry, the craft brewing industry has had. It's also spurred a demand for proprietary varieties. Our growers have taken it upon themselves to be able to breed specific different varieties using the needs of the craft brewers um, and, and uh, creating new varieties, having them be proprietary, having it as another source of income for their farm, which has really also helped some of the economic stability of this industry. Another aspect of the craft brewing industry uh, is the harvest on farm selection. Traditionally, hops have not been a uh, direct to consumer product. And so, you know, 20 years ago, there wasn't always a lot of interest spurred around the harvesting of hops since it wasn't going into a product that a consumer could pick off the shelf at a grocery store. However, craft brewers are innately attuned to the very to the specifics revolving around uh, food safety and quality. And so you'll see that in the three primary growing regions um, of the Pacific Northwest, the Willamette Valley, Treasure Valley, and Yakima Valley, uh, during harvest season, brewers from all over the world will swarm into those growing areas and, and make their selections for the upcoming year. Uh, it's really given our growers a platform to be able to articulate a lot of their a lot of their growing standards to make sure that they are um, being able to produce high quality um, high quality products. It's allowed our growers to um, really lean into different sustainability initiatives. Um, for instance, our growers, about 60% of the acreage in the Pacific Northwest is Global GAP certified. 
And it's also increased a consumer interest that is very novel to this industry. If you look on a can of craft brewer of craft beer, it might have the different varieties like labeled on the beer, which is very different. And it's just, it's put, um, it's, it's really just thrust the hop industry into more of a pop popular culture that it has not witnessed before. Next slide, please. So with that, I am pleased to next introduce uh, a video that will give you a little bit more uh, detail about the nuances of growing hops. This video is called Farm to Pint. It's a life cycle of hops. It's uh, created by one of our merchants, Yakima Chief Hops. It'll give you a little bit more overview about um, some of the challenges associated with growing hops. As we invite the world to experience hop harvest in the Pacific Northwest for the first time ever, we know many of you may be unfamiliar to the basics of hop farming. To help you follow along with our virtual harvest tours and seminars that we have to offer this month, we wanted to provide you with a basic overview of the journey that a hop takes from field to brew house. First, let's begin with the basic anatomy of a hop to better understand how hops grow. Hops are the ingredient at the heart of the iconic aromas and flavors of today's craft beers. As craft brewers have become more competitive and creative, they have turned hops into a diverse, thriving agricultural industry. As of 2019, hops occupy more than 55,000 acres of Pacific Northwest farmland. Scientifically named Humulus lupulus, hops are a cone-shaped flower that grow on the vine of a female hop plant. That's right, we said vine with a B, not vine like you'd find in a vineyard. Each component of a hop plays an important role in brewers' recipes, from the juiciest IPAs to the richest barrel-aged stouts. Hops contain four major components, the strig, bracteal, bract, and lupulin glands. The first three are the vegetative materials that give the hop cone its structure. The strig is the stem, the bract are the leaves, and the bracteal make up the inner skeleton. These three components' primary job is to protect the golden goodness locked inside, the lupulin. If you place a hop cone between the palms of your hands and rub them together, a distinct aroma is released. The majority of these characteristics come from the lupulin glands containing concentrated oils and resins. The resins contribute the alpha acids which, when boiled, determine the bitterness in beer. The higher the alpha acid, the greater the bittering potential. They also contain the beta acids, which are used for long-term effects, as they can change the profile of a beer depending on how it's stored. The essential oils of the lupulin glands determine the flavors and aromas of beer. The exotic hop aroma profiles, such as lush tropical fruits or fresh cut cedar, come from the various oil compounds. Each oil compound contributes specific aroma characteristics. For example, maracine contributes herbal and wood aromas, linalool contributes floral and fruity, and beta-pinene contributes pine and resin aromas. Different hop varieties contain different oil compounds, making each one unique. Now let's move on to how hops are prepped for planting, as well as how new varieties enter the market. Unlike many plants, hops are grown from rhizomes or the roots of the hop vine. Growers have the option to cultivate their fields using either rhizome cuttings or leaf cuttings. Their decision is based on many factors, including timing, weather, or variety. Hop rhizomes are acquired by digging them up from the fields at the end of winter, after the hop roots have laid dormant. The colder the winter, the better as freezing conditions are ideal for creating a dormant crop and allow for healthier hop plants. In the spring, hundreds of field workers crowd the empty fields with buckets to dig up rhizomes for the upcoming growing season. The second option is to cultivate from leaf cuttings or baby hops that are initially grown in a greenhouse setting during the off season. Because they already have started their growth, they are often planted later in the season than rhizomes Growers choose to utilize leaf cutting propagation for particular hop varieties for many reasons, one of the most common being for new experimental hops. 
Experimental hops are varieties that have not been fully commercialized in the hop industry. They are often identified by numbers, such as HBC 472 or YCR 14 or USDA 650009. The commercialization process takes about 10 to 20 years, during which varieties undergo an extensive elimination process, beginning in the greenhouse and slowly expanding from one hill to multiple acres when successful. Yakima Chief Hops works closely with one hop breeding and management company in particular, similarly named Yakima Chief Ranches. As integrated partners, YCR focuses on breeding new experimental hop varieties that benefit both growers and brewers, while YCH works to get them in the hands of brewers and gather feedback to determine their viability in the brew house. Yakima Chief Ranches supplies growers with clean planting material each year to promote quality and varietal purity. Once the hop rhizomes are dug up at the end of winter, growers and workers begin their spring field prep. Hops are grown on an 18-foot tall trellis system, requiring a lot of labor to establish, adjust, or repair acreage after the winter. Once the poles are in place, workers begin to restore the soil using traditional farming best practices, including disking and flaming. Disking is used for tilling the soil, which helps to remove any debris, prevent weeds, allow for proper water absorption, and create a clean growing surface. Flaming is used to kill and prevent weed growth. Once the soil is properly cured, growers begin laying their irrigation systems, including subsurface drip irrigation, which helps to save water and improve yield. Another preparation process that follows is twining, a fascinating activity performed by a highly skilled seven-person crew. Using a tractor-drawn elevated platform, seasoned field workers tie twine to the overhead trellis wires using a double-handed clove hitch knot. The workers that perform this activity are so skilled, manufacturers have been unable to replicate their precision and speed using a robot or machine. Members of the twining crew specialize in this double-handed knot and are famous in the industry for the incredible velocity. Growers have said that their twining crews are irreplaceable veterans on their farms and worth their weight in gold. While the workers overhead tie the knots, a crew on the ground secures the lower end of the twine with small metal clips using two to four strings for each plant. The biodegradable twine is either paper or coir, which is a coconut fiber. Once complete, the hanging twine signifies the beginning of the hop growing season. Once the field preparation is complete, growers plant their leaf or rhizome cuttings. The hop plant begins the formation of the crown or root system and shortly after, the early spring growth begins as green shoots pop out of the ground. The shoots are the beginning of the hop vine, which is the vine of the hop plant. Because hops grow vertically instead of horizontally, they are referred to as a bind. As the binds grow taller, the field workers begin training, a tedious process that can only be done by hand, one hop plant at a time. Field workers choose the best three to four hop shoots and wrap them in a clockwise direction around the twine. The twine works to support the hop binds as they make their 18-foot journey to the top of the trellis. Training can take place multiple times in the growing season and is a critical process affecting plant health and overall yield. From May to June, the binds focus all of their energy growing upward and are expected to reach the top of the trellis by summer solstice. After that, they focus their energy and nutrients on growing outward as they mature and begin to flower. Hot burrs start to develop, which look like small spiky florets. The hop burrs eventually turn into hop cones, each variety in field maturing at various rates based on planting time, weather, and other factors. Once the binds have established cones, the growers begin to monitor the moisture content, waiting patiently for the indication that it is time for harvest. The best time to harvest hops is called the harvest window, a time when the hop cones have anywhere between 20 to 23% dry matter. The dry matter percentage can increase in just one day, making harvesting hops an art that requires generations of experience, quick thinking, flexibility, and long hours. 
Growers and their crews must do whatever it takes to overcome any logistical challenges in order to harvest a quality crop. Currently, the most common method for harvesting hops is with the use of a bottom cutter and a top cutter. First, a tractor rolls through each row of hops, cutting the hop vines at the bottom close to the ground. Next, the top cutter comes through the rows, cutting the bind from the top of the trellis. Each bind falls into the back of a hop truck, which is then transported to the picking machine. Types of picking machines can vary from farm to farm. A few popular examples include the Donauer, Wolf, and Prot Harvester. Some picking machines require hop binds to be manually unloaded from the hop truck and hand strung onto hooks, while others require the use of loaders and forklifts to move their hop binds into the picker. From there, the hop cones are gently separated from the bind using different methods of picking and sorting, such as graded belts and shakers. The unwanted vegetative matter is carried off and often composted while the fresh whole hop cones are transported by conveyor belts to the kiln. The hop cones are poured into kiln beds, reaching about 18 to 36 inches deep. Dry, heated air is forced into the beds of the kiln at about 120 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The goal of kiln drying hops is to decrease the moisture content of the cones for better storage capability. Hops are harvested at approximately 75% moisture, and in order to preserve quality, they must be stored at roughly 9 to 10% moisture. Once the hops have cooled, they are transported into the baling room, where they are compressed into 200 pound bales. The bales are loaded onto a flatbed truck and delivered to Yakima Chief Hops cold storage facilities. During harvest, Yakima Chief Hops production facilities are flooded with incoming flatbed trucks stacked high with bales. The unmistakable hop aroma fills the air as skilled forklift operators quickly unload the bales with coordination and precision. The bales of whole leaf hops are lined up in front of the warehouse, while operation staff members conduct crucial moisture and quality tests on all incoming bales. All bales delivered to YCH must adhere to strict quality standards to ensure optimal storage and brewing capabilities. Trained staff members use a probe to test the moisture content of each bale, while core samples are taken back to the lab to analyze aromas, brewing values, and oil composition. Bales are returned to the grower if they do not meet quality specifications, which is why YCH implemented the Green Chief program. This program works with growers at the farm level all year long, sharing information between growers, establishing guidelines and best practices, and conducting farm and facility inspections to help ensure that only quality hops leave the farm. Once the bales have passed initial inspection, they are stacked in cold storage facilities kept at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. One warehouse alone can hold more than 1 million pounds of hops. The hops remain in bales until they are packaged as whole leaf hops and shipped to brewing customers or processed into additional product types, such as aged hops, T90 pellets, cryo hops, American Noble hops, CO2 hop extract, and other advanced products. Yakima Chief Hops offers a robust portfolio of hop products and solutions, allowing brewers to enhance their favorite beer styles using the best product fit for the job. These include traditional product types such as fresh hops, whole leaf hops, and T90 pellets. Fresh hops are whole wet cones delivered from farm to brewer within 36 hours to produce seasonal fresh hop ales. Whole leaf hops are kiln dried compressed whole leaf cones that are delivered in bales and broken up into various packaging sizes. T90 hop pellets are produced from kiln dried cones that have been hammer milled and pressed through a pellet die creating a product with consistent density best for repeatable brewing. Hot pellets retain all of the natural lupulin and cone material, have a longer shelf life, require less storage, and are generally easier to handle. Yakima Chief Hops has also created advanced hop products, providing solutions for common brewing problems and helping brewers remain competitive in the industry. Cryo Hops and American Noble Hops pellets are produced using innovative proprietary technology that separates the vegetative matter and the lupulin glands from dried whole leaf cones. American Noble Hops pellets contain mostly the vegetative matter contributing the more mild essential oils and aromas to beer, 
while cryo hops pellets contain the more powerful oils and resins for hoppy aromatic beers. CO2 hop extract and additional downstream specialty products are produced from T90 hop pellets. These products provide a wide range of enhanced brewing and storage capabilities. YCH continues to seek new ways to improve and develop innovative products that support our beer community and produce award-winning beers. Am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about arthropod pests. Uh, and so I'm Doug Walsh. I'm a professor and extension specialist, specialist of entomology with Washington State University. Worked with the hop industry for roughly about the last 20 years. Uh, slide, please. So to give you a little bit of background on what we've done in regards to pest management, this is sort of our field Bible. Uh, we've created several editions of this pest management uh, guidebook for growers. We also have a companion pocket size book that uh, is carried around in basically the pickup trucks of most uh, field men uh, and then field supervisors uh, that's bilingual. Uh, and basically it reads quite often, if you see this in the hop yard, you know, tell somebody about it. Uh, in this book, we identify all of the major pests and diseases and provide recommendations with uh, two hop growers as to what they should do about how they should sample, how they should treat these pests and diseases. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, we're probably getting due to, to do, per, basically produce another one of these pest management strategic plans for U.S. hops. We have completed two of them uh, in the past, with this most recent one being in November of 2014. And this is when we bring the industry together to prioritize uh, sort of the pest management strategies uh, that we're going to put forward uh, for the, basically the next 10 years. And this has been a very important document, I think, both for the EPA as well as when we go out and compete for uh, basically uh, extramural funding, primarily from NIFA and under other grad granting agencies. And we've been highly successful just because we've shown this uh, high degree of organization. And to sort of highlight it, Jim Farrar, uh, now the director of the uh, UC IPM program in California, but uh, prior to that, he was the director of the Western Region IPM program. And he took the uh, documents that we produced in 2008 and 2015 and, and truly showed how by our following sort of the strategic plan, uh, we really had improved integrated pest management in hops. Uh, next slide, please. So when it comes to the arthropod pests of hops, there are a number. Uh, there's aphids, uh, a complex of beetles, uh, garden symphylums, leafhoppers, uh, a number of caterpillars and spider mites. Uh, the ones that I've highlighted here with an asterisk tend to be the more key pests, and I will focus on them a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. So this is sort of an inter interesting pest. This is the California prionis. It really is a key pest, primarily in Idaho, but it is a big concern in Washington. Now, in our IPM uh, book that I talked about, uh, basically that IPM handbook, we highlight the states in gray for where these particular insect would be a pest. And as you can see here, this is a pest throughout the Western states. Uh, next slide, please. So the California prionis larva are, are quite large. Uh, they can grow to three inches over the course of several years and uh, they chew on plant roots. Uh, next slide, please. So again, these larvae feed on plant roots. Uh, the severe infestations can completely destroy crowns and kill plants. Uh, less severe infestations cause wilting, yellowing, and death uh, to one or more of the vines. 
And again, the feeding damage is likely to be associated with the occurrence of secondary crown rot pathogens. Uh, next slide, please. So what the growers uh, do for uh, Prionis, uh, you know, in, in, in a desperate situation, they will destroy the heart, hop yard and fumigate. Uh, they cannot replant the hops or alternative hosts for several years. And as a drastic measure, ethoprop is actually applied in fall applications following harvest. Now we have worked with the IR4 biopesticide program, and we have basically demonstrated that uh, a, a pheromone that was developed by Larry Hanks and uh, Jocelyn Miller uh, actually can be very effective in a mating dis disruption program. And sort of, you know, uh, we've hit an impasse with registering this pheromone for use in a mating disruption program. Again, IR4 support, supported the research, but the registrant does not want to pay for the required studies. Uh, and again, the law is the law, but let's think about what uh, registering this uh, pheromone would be replacing. Uh, and again, we've demonstrated that it is effective in a mating disruption program. Uh, next slide, please. We've had a recent uh, outbreak of the Japanese beetle in Grandview, Washington. Uh, the WSDA is doing its job and basically creating a, uh, a quarantine zone that's adversely impacting growers that are in the area. Uh, again, the, the WSDA is, is doing its job and trying to, uh, and has been funded to conduct an eradication program. Uh, we do think that we do have a candidate insecticide in the pipeline, uh, cyan tranilaprol. Uh, again, the petition is going to be submitted soon. Uh, this petition for uh, cyan tranilaprol on hops is being bundled with uh, mint and basil. And uh, we are considering submitting a, a possible Section 18 request from Washington uh, in 2023 for cyan tranilaprol for Japanese beetle control. Uh, next slide, please. We do have hop aphids. Uh, again, uh, the hop aphid is probably the number one arthropod pest in Oregon, and I'd say the number two arthropod pest in Washington State and uh, Idaho. And the hop aphid is a widespread in uh, throughout North America, a potential pest throughout the U.S. Uh, whenever anybody's going to plant hops in a state outside of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, next slide, please. So what do growers do for hop aphid control? Well, a standby has been chemigation with imidacloprid, uh, foliar sprays with spirotetramat. Uh, we have sort of documented that early season uh, infestations in Washington state of hop aphid really do not impact the brewing quality of hops. And th this is uh, not true for Oregon where their more mild summer permits the hop, uh, pardon, the aphids to persist throughout the bulk of the summer. Uh, next slide, please. Now, sort of the, the key arthropod pest in hops are spider mites. Uh, the two-spotted spider mites are present throughout uh, the U.S. in hop yards. Uh, next slide, please. And again, the spider mites uh, damage the uh, basically the hop binds when they're feeding on the leaves. And again, this, uh, you know, this discoloration, basically it reduces the amount of photosynthesis that the, the hop plant can, can conduct when uh, damage is extreme. We've had instances where we've had uh, complete defoliation of hop yards when these spider mite uh, populations just cannot be controlled. Uh, next slide, please. So the most economic damage is late season when the hop, uh, the mites actually get into the hop cones and damage them as you see here. Uh, these cones would be rejected by the hop merchants like Yakima Chief and it would be a complete loss to the, the grower. Uh, we have documented that even at relatively low infestations that the uh, mite feeding can reduce the alpha acids. That's the acid that basically promotes the bitterness in beers. And again, when infestations are severe, brewer rejection or total crop loss can occur. Uh, next slide, please. So the primary method uh, for control is still applying miticides. Uh, there are some growers putting some efforts into uh, biological control uh, and are actually purchasing predatory mites and predatory 
uh, spider mite destroyer beetles. Now, a focus in my research program has been looking at sort of the resistance uh, of mites to these specific uh, chemicals, and we have had well-documented instances of field failures, uh, and in essence, a caricide resistance primarily to abamectin, hexithiazox, and etoxazole. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we've basically summarized this in a review article. And so at this point, we've basically identified molecular markers uh, for uh, acaricide resistance in literally all the uh, acaricides that are used in uh, hop yards for spider mite control and uh, basically published that in this review article using uh, hops as sort of the model system. And then we detail this. Uh, and then moving forward into the future, next slide, please. I'm actually working now with Feng Zhu, uh, the uh, insect toxicologist at Penn State University. And what we're in the process now is developing these paper strip uh, tests. Uh, we'll, we'll be working primarily with biphenazate, abamectin, and bifenthrin. And what we hope to do is be able to go out into hop yards and uh, basically take a, a cohort of mites, we're hoping to get it down to as low as about 10 to 15 adult spider mites, squash them, and basically use these tests as sort of a, a litmus type paper test for uh, quantifying the amount of a caricide resistance in those field populations. We were working with a private uh, cooperator uh, towards bringing these tests forward and uh, when COVID hit and uh, they sort of dropped us because they were going to make a lot more money developing tests for COVID uh, than for spider mite resistance in hop yards. But uh, they're coming back to us now that the pandemic seems to be uh, moving forward, you know, going away. And again, I think this technology will bridge to a, num a number of other crops and a number of other pests. Uh, my final slide, please. And I am the IR4 state liaison representative from Washington state. And so uh, I basically went on to the IR4 food crop database. And, uh, you know, basically these are the number of requests, the number of trials, the total number of chemicals. And uh, again, this is specifically for hops. So I think that uh, the hop industry owes a, a great deal of uh, uh a great deal of oh God, whatever uh, uh, reliance to the uh, IR4 program, and it's been a good partnership. So, anyway, I'll I'll quiet up now, and we can move on to somebody else. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, good afternoon or morning, everyone. Uh, I'm David Gent. I'm a research plant pathologist with USDA out of Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, I'll be presenting on some of the priority diseases affecting hops in the Western US. At the end of these few slides, I'll turn this over to my colleague and counterpart at Michigan State, Dr. Tim Miles, uh, for the um, Midwestern and Eastern US perspective. Next, please, Jen. So there's a lot that can go wrong with hop production. Uh, this slide just shows a number of different disease issues, each separate on, on the cones. Next. And the, the two I'll be speaking about mostly today is a powdery mildew and a downy mildew. And so uh, this is powdery mildew, what we're seeing here. And like powdery mildews on um, every crop, the symptoms um, appear as these uh, powdery white uh, colonies on, on the leaves and other tissues. And the fungus, if we zoom in on, the, on those colonies, have a huge, what we're seeing is just masses of the fungus. And it, Powdery mildews have a very high uh, reproductive rate, which leads to very explosive epidemics. And this is the primary dry weather disease of, of hop. Next, please. So what we really care about is the cone infection. And so this is a scenario if you take no control measures on a highly susceptible variety, uh, the marketable yield will be zero. Um, the harvest of what you actually harvest might be 10% of the potential. Uh, but the quality defects make it unsaleable. Next, please. So th that's a very extreme example. This is the example from a few years ago um, where we were alerted to a, a field. This is in uh, early August. Everything looked okay from the outside. Um, and then next slide, please. 
And when we pull one of the plants down, I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but notice that every cone in the interior of the canopy has powdery mildew on it. it's white. So this, this was a 40 acre field. The grower had invested about $200,000 in production expenses to this point, and they cut the field down, they didn't harvest. So they had a $200,000 direct loss. They would have actually taken this field to harvest. They would have uh, had returns of about $400,000. So very significant losses. And so even with sometimes what we think are best control measures, there still are these catastrophic losses that, that can occur. Next, please. So this is a, another example. This is a few years dated, but this was a um, these quality defects that can occur can be just as important as as the direct yield losses from powdery mildew and from downy mildew, as we'll see in a minute as well. So th this is a picture of a, a variety called Willamette, and Willamette. Um, well, you can see there's if you notice there, there's a few cones here that are discolored. Next, please. And what happens is um, when there's late season infection from powdery mildew, what you, you really notice is after the cones are, have gone through that killed and drying process. And so instead of having um, that typically bright green color, you're expecting the color is bleached out. And this late season infection can be associated with uh, off flavors or aromas that can translate into the beer, at least certain styles of beer depending on how hops are used. And so this is a serious quality defect. Next, please. And so this is a this is a picture from multiple years ago. Each of these bales are 200 pounds each, and these are um, just waiting to be destroyed. So here, this is this is really a worst case scenario where the growers went through all the work, all the incurred all the expenses, only to have to destroy a crop at, at the end. Next, please. So the um, with powdery mildew, the uh, the impact of the disease. What we really care about is the cone infection. Next, please. And what you see on the top. In, in this slide, these are cones we took at different developmental stages. And then on bottom, those are those when we inoculate them with the powdery mildew fungus, track, track them all the way to harvest. This is what they look like at harvest. And just for comparison, on the far right of your screen, that's a non inoculated control. And so what you can see is that those early infections are the most detrimental to both quality um, and also yield and the most impactful. So the so basic premise of the control measures are about delaying infection of the cones as long as possible. So reducing inoculum levels and then slowing the rate of ep epidemics. Next, please. So that's the principle. Um, the, what happens in practice though, is this is very challenging to do because what we really care about ultimately is the cone infection. Cones bloom starts around the um, summer sol solstice or just after. And so somewhere near July 1st, you were seeing uh, bloom in certain varieties harvest is occurring in late August to through September. And that's when we have that the potential for cone infection. But the epidemic is actually starting very early in the season at emergence. And so as soon as there's some green growth in the field, uh, we can find powdery mildew active. So the control measures are starting in, in April. And there's a very long period of growers trying to suppress the disease for, again, for delaying and minimizing the cone infection that occurs um, in summer and early autumn. Next, please. So the uh, over powdery mildew has been present in the Northwest uh, for just over 20 years now. And they, there's control measures in place and the foundation of these is, is cultural practices. And so this is just an example of that. In spring, the, the first flush of growth is removed in a pruning practice. And so what you're seeing is that um, on the bottom, uh, it's actually a hop yard on the right, doesn't look like it, but that is a hop yard. And so the fungus is an obligate parasite, which means that it has to have living tissue of the host to be able to reproduce. So if growers, therefore, an important part of disease management is eliminating and managing the amount of, of, of green tissue that the fungus has available to it. So if we can actually thoroughly eliminate that first flush of growth, you, you can have actually a local extinction of the fungus in a given field, and it certainly delays epidemic development. Next slide, please. Later in the season, growers are doing things like removing basal foliage as what's shown here on your left. And this can be done with uh, chemical herbicides, uh, sometimes done with uh, nitrogen fertilizers as well, but, or this can be done manually as you're seeing on the right. Again, modifying the, the canopy and trying to modify the environment to be less favorable for the disease. Next, please. 
Fungicides are an important part of disease management. And what you'll hear about in a minute um, from Maggie is the, um, the issues with related to MRLs. And so the, the hop industry with EPA and IR4 and, and industry partners have been very active in pursuing registrations for a number of different fungicides uh, for powdery mildew. So this is a an exhaustive list, but a representative list. And it looks like um, the growers have most of the chemistry that would be available, crop protection tools available for powdery mildew. However, um, about half the crop is exported and the MRL incongruence in export markets creates a non-tariff trade barrier. And so it limits uh, what is done in practice by, by growers in the US. And so on, on this list, you can see that in some of the important export markets like the EU, there's already ML, MRL incongruence that limits the use of, of certain compounds. Next, please. And then we have concerns that with the change in the, re the regulatory policy ag and the ag policy in, in the EU, that there'll be future MRL issues that create these um, trade barriers as well. So that, those are indicated here. The other thing that is resistance management, it, uh, unlike every other powdery mildew disease where you have this very specific fungicides with specific mode of action and a pathogen population that's very adaptable, and high reproductive rate, resistance is always a concern. So some of the fungicides shown here have a shared mode of action. So this list really doesn't tell you what's truly available to the growers. And so the, this becomes a real challenge for the growers. How do you put together a disease management program that is effective and adheres to the rules of resistance management and still enables export to um, whatever the export market might be? Next, please. So one of the, there's, there's much interest and much research going on into uh, non-synthetic alternatives. But one of the, something like sulfur, and this is, this transcends conventional production into organic production, we simply can't re do product replacement with a product like sulfur because of um, impacts or potential impacts on non-target organisms such as spider mites. Next slide, please. Um, so a picture says it has a thousand, or a thousand words. So this is just a, a photo from a few years ago where we looked at just substituting synthetic fungicides with sulfur. And you can see on the left, these are the cones from plants that received only sulfur as a fungicide versus ones that had a no sulfur. And so simple product substitution becomes a challenge as well. Next. Okay, so that is powdery mildew. For downy mildew, this will be an abbreviated overview. This is the wet, typical wet weather disease that we see, um, well, in most areas of the world where hops are grown. And so this is a, a cousin, a sister species to the cucurbit downy mildew organism. And next slide, please. Uh, one of the, um, the characteristic uh, signs and symptoms of this disease is what we call um, colloquially spikes. And so the, the downy mildew pathogen on hop is actually systemic. And so one of the most damaging phases of the disease is when there's the shoots are infected. So that can occur in spring at limiting the number of shoots that can be trained or it can be infection of the branches, the cone bearing branches. So in this photo, this short branch is infected so that it will never produce the, the, the cones that would have potentially been produced on that branch. Next, please. Like powdery mildew, you can have cone infection as well. So this is leads to quite severe uh, losses of yield and, and certainly quality. Next. And as I mentioned, the pathogen is systemic. And so which of, uh, which can lead to um, problems in downy mildew can enter the propagation stream. And so you see this potted plant on your right, that plant is actually systemically infected with downy mildew. And so the, the shoot that's emerging in the greenhouse, it has, uh, has one of those small spikes, a systemic infection. And the left, this is the rhizome pieces and you can see that decay. So certain varieties are, uh, are sensitive to crown infection, they'll actually die. And so this is, so there's multiple ways downy mildew can um, negatively affect the plant. This has implications for spread and propagation material as well. So there can be chronic effects of downy mildew because of this systemic nature of the disease. Next, please. So at, um, with the sister species, cucurbit downy mildew, the, the cucurbit downy mildew pathogen rather. 
uh, fungicide resistance is a huge issue. And we do have several examples of resistance um, in the hop downy mildew organism. And so one of the mainstays, um, it, certainly in Western Oregon, was a phosphonate compound. And so this was a trial we did several years ago. And you can, you can see on the left that those yellow shoots, those are the spikes on the plants treated with a regular rotation of phosphonate products. On the right, this was other fungicides. And so there is documented resistance to phosphonates as well as um, the phenol amides such as methanoxum. And that's uh, largely changed uh, how growers approach disease management. Next, please. So this, I think, is the where challenge growers have. They're, they're balancing competing of production objectives. They have to consider resistance management for the diseases, efficacy of the products, MRLs, because at least half of the crop is exported, effects on non-target organism. They might have third-party certification um, schemes, such as salmon safe or others that they're following. And then just the simple logistics of, of controlling the disease. So it makes it for a real puzzle that trying to put together and build a management program. Next, please. So because of that, one of the um, you know the ongoing need and challenge is to is to have a is to identify and register efficacious crop protection compounds that, of course, have a favorable environmental um, toxicology um, package, are sustainable, um, enable resistance management, and also can mitigate these non. Um, tariff trade barriers created by non-harmonized MRLs. Um, so that with finding non-chemical alternatives are the priority for my research and industry research. So with that, I'm gonna turn the slide over, the presentation over to Tim Miles to talk about issues affecting the, the Michigan industry as well. Hey Dave, thanks for the handoff. Um, so uh, I just wanted to give a look at what things look like in Michigan and kind of a sense of what things might look in the eastern uh, part of the U.S. for hops. And uh, I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University, and I split my time between a couple other crops as well besides hops. So next slide, please. So uh, primarily, I know powder mildew is the main focus uh, in the Pacific Northwest, but in the east, from a disease management perspective, probably our number one disease is really downy mildew. And that's what growers tend to manage. This is our wet disease that we struggle with pretty much all season long. Um, it, it can infect the cones. And if it gets really bad in a yard early in the season with lots of spikes, there's a lot of disease pressure, particularly if we get a lot of summer rains, it can be a problem. And also if we have heavy dews that kind of often occur in Michigan um, when the dew point changes around late July and in August. So that can really drive downy mildew epidemics. Powdery mildew has shown up a little bit more as our industry has kind of grown over the last 10 years. Um, and it's something we focus on. Um, and I, I, we have a new disease that we've identified a few years ago called halo blight. And we're still trying to figure out exactly what are the best cultural practices to manage that. And then also what are some of the chemical approaches that might work. Oh, and we also suffer from a number of cone diseases that can be an issue in Michigan. So next slide, please. From a registration perspective, though, hops are really like a tale of two diseases. And it's really because of the work that is done out in the Pacific Northwest. And this is as Michigan started to grow as an industry. We always thought that downy and powder mildew would be our most critical diseases. And the downy mildew part has been true. I would say the powdery probably not quite as much. However, we do gain a lot of different management tools. Uh, when you look at powdery mildew, a lot of the registrations that have been pushed through IR4 do allow us to have a larger toolbox when dealing with possibly other fungal diseases. But that, that having the powdery mildew emphasis might be helpful as we kind of encounter a new disease. Um, cultural management is really important, uh, as, as Dave kind of covered, and um, but in, in, in the eastern U.S., chemical management is quite important, and that kind of makes resistance being a problem. So next slide, please. So they've covered it pretty well, so we don't have to spend too long of a time, but um, essentially having a lot of downy mildew infections can really cause crowns to die, it can cause cone infections, and it's really our largest issue in the Great Lakes region um, where we grow hops. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but there are, they've covered this too, but there are several other pathogens that can uh, cause issues with hop cones. And essentially, these are a larger issue in Michigan. Um, I would say that we see a lot of co-infections of multiple diseases kind of all at once. And ultimately, it can affect quality if they're infected, but really it can also induce shatter. And that's uh, almost a direct yield loss of the cone 
during the harvesting process. And, you know, we have everything from downy mildew to powdery mildew uh, to fusarium tip blight and alternaria cone disorder. And I will tell you, they're very difficult to tell um, what's actually causing that issue, unless you look under a microscope. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2018, um, uh, we've really been dealing with a new disease in the Great Lakes region. And it was kind of identified in Michigan at the same time being identified in Connecticut. Um, but we've got samples from pretty well all over the place um, in the Great Lakes area, at least not in the Pacific Northwest, but in the Great Lakes area. And we typically see uh, foliar necrosis, which we weren't as concerned about, where you see a halo blight, we called it halo blight eventually, um, like it's a colorotic area around the lesion, but it would often girdle the cone, sometimes affect the end of the cone, depending on when the symptoms happen. But the main part is that it caused shatter. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we've really got samples from all over the Great Lakes regions, so anywhere that's growing hops, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, we've identified this uh, issue. Uh, next slide, please. And the main issue, um, can you hit, uh, hit the slide once it should play a video. The main issue is that dried cones, they're, they're flowers essentially. And when a dried cone is, is dried, whether it's an infection or some other stress, basically the, the cone literally just falls apart. And if you do any kind of mechanical processing, it gets lost. So this is an image on the right there of a processor that is losing a lot of brack tissue that's going through the system. So the cone uh, basically, that's like a direct yield loss. So they might have thought they were getting a certain yield, but much of the flower tissue is lost as waste. And, and that's sort of the main struggle. Uh, next slide. So if you look close, this is our new disease. Uh, basically, this is a fungal structure that's causing issues on both leaves and on cones. And this is it's reproducing. Again, it's a wet disease. So these are fungal structures called pycnidia that are making a type of ooze, essentially. And that allows these spores to basically splash around inside of um, the hop yard. Um, next slide. So this is kind of my last slide because I know we're running a little short, but essentially I would say that now in Michigan, because we, we have so many tools set up already to control downy mildew, um, really halo blight, which is what we've named this disease that we're seeing on leaves and, uh, and on cones. This has become probably our largest issue in Michigan. Um, it's, it's, ca it's causing up to about 75% yield losses in certain blocks if they, if they weren't being treated with different fungicides. We're working on cultural practices to manage it, um, but uh, that's a, a kind of an issue. It's also sometimes called Femopsis in grapes, so we're kind of borrowing some management tools that we use in grapes actually to kind of implement them on hops, but that'll take a few more years. But really continual registration of fungicides because we're inadvertently, because we're controlling powdery mildew, we're probably inadvertently controlling some of this halo blight potentially, but we're really at the early phases of trying to be able to do that. And I've been trying to work with a few registrants on helping get uh, this disease on a label because it's already labeled for hops. It's just a matter of expanding the label to this new disease. So with that, that's all I have and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you both very much. Um, as was mentioned, we are running a little bit behind. So I see a lot of questions in the chat. I would just encourage you guys to continue um, using the chat to ask and answer any questions and we will move on. Good morning. Marcelo Moretti here with OSU uh, working with science. So I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the issues I'm seeing on a uh, West Coast based problems. And I think Dr. Sosnowski will, will cover what she's seeing hops in the East Coast. Uh, yeah, thank you. So what are the key weed species that we have? And this is identified mostly by, by hop growers here in, in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Kosha, number one in dry regions. Something is important to say comparing Oregon to Washington is the rainfall here in Oregon. We are about 40 inches rainfall on average, and in Washington, Yakima, I would say it's less than 10. Somebody, Doug Walsh will probably know exactly what the number is, but it's much drier. So that's where kosher uh, will thrive. We're seeing kosher in those states, and I suspect if we start screening for resistance, resistant kosher coming from other cropping systems into hops will be more and more uh, pre prevalent. I know in Idaho, they have glyphosate resistant kosher and maybe group two resistant kosher as well. Uh, the second team would be mostly the perennial weeds, yellow nutsedge, Canada tissue, and field bindweed. And, and those are, are very problematic, especially 
Canada Tissue Field Bindweed here in Oregon, the patches where we see it, they, they start growing right at the time we are uh, stringing the hops. And, and the Canada Tissue in, in these late varieties, the Canada Tissue could be so tall that it's even hard to see where the strings are meeting the ground and how to train the hops. And the problem is most of the tools we would have available would be after training. And that, and if you miss that early timing, it gets really difficult to control weeds like that. Also based in Oregon, the Italian ryegrass, uh, which I'm seeing more and more resistance, including to glyphosate, glyphosate, paraquat, uh, clatidine, and even ALS. I think we have a huge collection and combinations of this type of resistance. It, it's moving in most crops and in hops as well. Other weeds I see is summer annuals uh, here and there. Uh, witch grass is very important uh, on, on the panicon genus here in Oregon. Uh, but there are also other perennials like curly dock. It's, it's hard to, to point out which one would be the number six here. Next slide, please. So, so what are the tools available? I would say based on what I'm seeing growers, tillage between the row crops would be uh, the most common thing. Sometimes I see cover crops mostly in Oregon as they move to Washington, just the lack of rainfall, this, this row meadows are tilled. Uh, there's very little tillage in the planting row. There's no tillage in the planting row after, after training. It's just because these strings are there and there's no chance you can really uh, manage the weeds around it without uh, disturbing that. And one important part is that those strings needs to be firm because if you start seeing a lot of uh, movement, uh, even with wind, some of those shoots of those binds can break at the base uh, and that's a big problem so tillage would basically undo all the work that the the training team uh, has done so herbicides really dominate what we're doing at the base of the plants uh, when it comes to herbicides i would say the majority of growers and all of them are using some sort of pre-emergence or soil active herbicides in winter to uh, fall to late winter and two maybe three post-emergence in season, including one for uh, 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 spring pruning, or which is burning back the hops about this time of the year to reduce uh, weed pressure. Uh, next slide, please. So how many herbicides we have since the chemical weed control is so important? Uh, we have 16 label herbicides, and this is in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, which sounds pretty good, but looking at the pre-emergence, out of those seven pre-emergence herbicides, we're basically relying on two, which are the least restrictive when it comes to groundwater uh, or MRL uh, exports, uh, saying that flumioxacin, Chateau or Tuscany, and, and, and there are other generic ones. It's almost every field I've been to has been treated with it the previous year or in that current year. Uh, the second one would be uh, Pendimentalin Prowl. Uh, Isoxabine is a new one, trellis. I don't know how much acreage has been treated with that. But another one would be Allion that we have a label for a little while now, but I think the MRL export is basically limiting where we use it. Uh, Outlook, uh, which should be in that list somewhere. Uh, it's another herbicide that, that is often used, but uh, there are problems with salmon safe, at least here in Oregon. So places where it can be used, the fields where it can be used are really limited. When it comes to post emergence, it's a very similar situation. We have glyphosate, but it's a winter only type of product when the hops are dormant. A challenge for us here to, to really pinpoint when the hops are dormant because we're having these heat waves mid, mid winter. We don't quite have a strong winter in, in, in the Willamette Valley. So we're relying mostly on Carfentrazon, uh, uh, Clatodine for grasses, and Stinger after training, which is Clopyrolid. Uh, for Canada tissue mostly. Uh, some of the other products like uh, caprylic acid is organic, so I would say it's cost prohibited. 2,4-D, we have a label for raw meadows, but I'm not aware of many people using it. And pyroflufen is a new herbicide that I'm seeing uh, uh, more use, but it's very comparable to a carfentrazone. It has the same mode of action, same weed spectrum. So uh, when it comes to resistance measurement, we're not doing much. Uh, next slide, please. So problems that we have with the current approach, well, the first one is MRLs. Sometimes we do have a good tool, but we can't use. And this is a moving target because we are about to develop a new tool. And this is the case where glyphosate and IR4, we're currently doing some work on, on, on that. 
uh, we're about to get a new tool and then the MRLs are changing. Herbicide resistance, I, I'm saying, hey, I believe this will be a bigger problem. Uh, Italian ryegrass here, it's very difficult to control at the time we have the tools available. It's very difficult to suppress ryegrass if we don't have something that's good at the dormant stage. Kosher is the same idea and the perennial weeds as well. If they are growing too early compared to when the hops are growing, then the management tools become much less effective. An environmental aspect is not just being effective, but being compatible or suitable with the production system, very much like the fungicides. Uh, next slide, please. So where, where do we see the needs in weed science? Well, no chemical tools for sure. I saw that example of the flaming. I don't know how many growers have access to the flaming, but we need non-chemical tools that are effective and, and cost-effective. You know, uh, There are times we use those tools once a year. It's really hard to justify the cost of investing in such equipment uh, if, if it doesn't pay back. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm focusing my efforts on electric weed controlling hops if there is a, a potential for that. Uh, additional herbicides or additional ways to apply the herbicides. I think more, more structure on how we use raw metals applications would be important. I've been doing some work with sponge wipers with clopyrrolid and trying to extend that to other herbicides. And uh, a little bit more clarification on, on what kind of work is needed to support this type of registration would be interesting because at the application method, we're not really exposing the crop foliage because something like glyphosate can be applied over the top with sponge wipers. Uh, so residue shouldn't be a concern. Uh, applications through uh, chemigation, especially drip irrigation, I think would be more important so we can apply specific AIs at the time when the biology makes sense. Because right now we're just applying when the rainfall is available. If we have different application methods, we could start moving around chemistries and, and targeting germination or other uh, weak links from the biology of different species. And, and also how to handle MRL exempt products there. There's at least one that I've been working around and what's the way forward would be interesting to hear from IR4 and APA on how to, to do that. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is it for me. Dr. Sosnowski will continue for now. Hi, thank you. My name is Lynn Sosnowski and I'm a weed scientist at Cornell Agritech in Geneva and I am just starting work with our New York hops industry. Obviously, as you've heard already, that hops is predominantly uh, produced in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, uh, New York doesn't even have a good sense on how large our industry is, but we're undertaking a survey now to uh, further define our growers and our grower needs. Uh, it was mentioned previously about craft breweries and craft breweries um, kind of driving the interest in hops in the United States. And, and, and that is certainly true for New York State. We have a significant number of craft breweries. Additionally, for a New York brewery to receive a farm brewery license, they need to source at least 60% of their hops and other ingredients from growers within New York State. So developing a vibrant, dynamic New York State hops industry is very important. And this is actually further supported by investment uh, from our state government itself. Right now, uh, New York has a hops breeding program that's being administered and run by Dr. Larry Smart. It's a line item in the New York State budget. Uh, they're doing significant work looking at halo blight. Uh, they're also um, including and developing a new a demonstration hop yard where the suitability of new cultivar entries can be evaluated under New York climate conditions. Next slide, please. So some of the weed issues that are facing New York growers, I spoke to several of them. Uh, dewberry, which is a rubrous species, quackgrass, Canada thistle, like Dr. Moretti mentioned earlier, artemisia, which goes under the common name mugwort. We also have issues with yellow nut sedge and phragmites. And kind of what's important to understand uh, of all of these weed species, they are all perennials. So persist over time, their life cycles um, occur over or multiple years. And when they become established, they're very, very, very difficult to manage, even with our best uh, chemical practices. Next slide, please. So New York growers, 
uh, engage in a lot of different weed control practices. And that includes uh, physical weed control before stringing takes place. Uh, these practices serve multiple purposes in addition to controlling the weeds. It helps set plant maturity, cleans up trash, is, is useful for downy mildew management. Unfortunately, with some of these physical control practices, it also can serve to facilitate the spread of rhizomatous uh, perennial weeds, so increasing their dispersal within a single hop yard. We do use flaming here. Some growers use flaming uh, as well as herbicides. Uh, some of the dominant products that are being used that Dr. Moretti mentioned, flumioxazin, glyphosate, clethodim, carfentrazone, and clopyrrolid. So of these three, um, only glyphosate and uh, clopyrrolid, well, clethodim has systemic activity, but it's not very effective against its target species, which is quackgrass. Um, glyphosate and clopyrrolid are systemic herbicides. Clopyrrolid has a very narrow spectrum of weed control, so it's only effective against certain species. Uh, glyphosate it can be used against many perennial species, but we have issues with respect to the timing of when it can be used safely in the crop and when our weed species are most sensitive uh, to glyphosate management, and those don't necessarily uh, line up. Next slide, please. So with respect to the weed control needs from the growers that I spoke to, uh, better weed can, uh, perennial weed suppression is extremely important as well as more post-harvest options. They're also very interested in novel technology and non-chemical tools to meet consumer demands for less chemical use in the system. Uh, like for instance, Dr. Marini mentioned uh, electric weeding and some new novel technologies uh, that could be deployed in the system. Next slide. So I am again, just getting started into uh, weed management and hops. And uh, I'm working closely with Rick Peterson, Chad Miggs, John Conzella, as well as Larry Smart. And want to thank the IR4 project and ISK Biosciences. Uh, we're conducting some work looking at uh, a novel active ingredient uh, for use in hops and other perennial systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Um, before Maggie resumes her discussion, I did want to point out that uh, we have gone over time, so I apologize to everybody if you have another meeting that you have to go to. Um, we will be posting this um, either later today or tomorrow on our website, and we will send out the recording to all attendees. So we hope you can stay on for the remainder, but if not, uh, we will be sending that recording soon. Uh, so Maggie, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, our scientists have showcased in a very compelling way how our growers need to navigate really a high wire act when they're balancing all the different plant protection tools. They need to understand the efficacy of the product and be able to maintain a high quality crop. They need to understand its implications for trade access as well as third party certification programs. So one, uh, one organization really born out of this need uh, in the 1980s, the US Hop Industry Plant Protection Committee was comprised. And the, the meaning, the meeting behind the Plant Protection Committee was to assist producers in navigating pest management issues by directing the delivery of plant protection tools, making sure that our growers have a diversity of tools available so they have a strong integrated pest management system. And the committee also endeavors to harmonize international standards and secure trade access for US hops. These two are very main priorities, foremost priorities for the industry. And you might take a step back and wonder, why is the harmonization of MRL so important, so vital to this industry? Next slide, please. And the answer is that what was already mentioned, the US hop industry exports half of our crop. Maintaining trade access abroad is, is central to the economic integrity of this industry. And you, we've, we've, we've talked about how hops can only be grown in very specific concentrated areas of the world. However, there's a lot of countries in the world that would like to enjoy a beer. Therefore, we, we export to over 60 different countries. We, we export to some of the most obscure corners of the world to make sure that brewers have hops to be able to brew beer. 
And that introduces a lot of complexities when you're working with the regulatory systems of other governments. Now, another layer to this is that a third of our crop is exported to the European Union. And so the European Union is one of our most important trading partners. And we export crops to go to the European Union for use in the European Union. But for many of our merchants, it's also used as a hub where, um, where the crop is, it goes, is exported and then transshipped to other countries. So it's used as an intermediary hub as well. And the, next slide, please. The MRL issue has several different facets. For one reason, the MR, MRLs are very, over, we're very conscious about MRLs in the US hop industry because we are such a small volume, but high value crop. Since we, since last year, we had a record year. We produced about 116 million pounds of hops. Uh, you know, that is as, as a world market, that's a rather small quantity, but it's a high value crop. And it's something that we cannot afford to close our doors to other, to export markets. As you've witnessed, hops undergo serious pest and disease pressure. So it's vitally important that our producers have these tools at their fingertips to make sure they can grow a high quality crop. This has, um, this has caused the emergence of do not use lists where our merchants every year send out um, basically pesticide use restrictions that our growers receive that was that was mentioned before that really restricts the compounds available to our growers and when they can use them um, to make sure that the hops that they are growing can be exported to the largest amount of countries. Typically our merchants tend to adhere to the lowest common denominator when it comes to MRLs to open up all the access available abroad. And some other crops in the world, um, they adhere to, they are able to segregate their crops to make sure that, you know, they can pinpoint this crop is going to Japan, therefore we can adhere to these values at these MRL issues. And that is very difficult for the hop industry because of the volatile nature of the brewing industry. It's very hard for merchants to surmise a year or two in ahead where the demand will be for the specific variety since we grow 60 different varieties. And so because of all these layering complexities, it makes it very difficult for us to segregate the crops. Thus, MRLs are a very present important issue and it places a lot of restrictions on our growers. Next slide, please. So something that the US Hop Industry Plant Protection Committee does is each month we release an MRL chart to our growers, merchants, registrants, crop consultants, important people in our industry. And this, this MRL chart gives a list of the compounds that our growers are using, um, as well as the target markets that we're looking at, or not even the target markets, the markets that we export to. And every month it's this, this running tally of where pending established MRLs are in these other markets so that our hop growing community can be apprised of where we're sitting and where different where we are able to export these crops to. Next slide, please. Now, we certainly have an uphill challenge in front of us. This work is not becoming any easier. Um, in 2020, the farm to fork strategy was established um, and it, it instills that by 2030, the European Union seeks to reduce pesticides by 50%, also by reducing the use of fertilizer by 20%, and by increasing organic farmland by 25%, all within 10 years, all by 2030. This means that our counterparts in Germany will can expect to be losing uh, their chemistries, but one important aspect of the farm to fork strategy is that the European Green Deal and uh, that the European Union intends to export this policy to their trading partners. So we as American producers can also expect to lose our MRLs, to lose our renewals, and thus to face many of the same restrictions. Seeing that we export a third of our crops to the European Union, this is very, uh, this is very, this is a pressing challenge for our industry. Next slide, please. Before we mention that we have long-standing partnerships and commitments with our foreign trading partners, among them um, the German hop industry, uh, just two years ago, two or three years ago, we established a formalized partnership with the German hop industry, Hop Growers of America did, through the U.S. Um, hop industry, plant protection industry. Together, we collaboratively fund harmonization efforts um, all across the world to maintain export uh, trade access for hops everywhere. We also have representation on the EU Commodity Expert Group uh, on Minor Uses, which is one of the regulatory bodies for specialty crops in the European Union. And we also are very active 
at the International Hop Growers Convention, was a, which is a forum of growers worldwide, where we can work with others to really maintain a, a mind's eye on some of the pressing challenges that other countries are experiencing and uh, collaboratively work together to, to target these, these different issues. Next slide, please. So going forward, we expect that MRLs will re remain as one of the foremost challenges of our industry. We recognize as an industry the necessity of continuing to explore softer chemistries, to continue to investigate biocontrol measures, but the heart of our well, the heart of our integrated pest management systems will likely always be some of those those core chemistries that we will use to maintain, and um, we we expect there to be many challenges ahead, but also recognize that with the support of the IR4 program. Um, we we will work in the past as we have with our very talented scientists at our disposal to continue in the future uh, work towards uh, navigating these challenges and making sure that American hops can be exported to many different countries abroad. So with that, before I cede the floor to questions, I'd like to introduce another key member of the Hop Growers of America team who has been working diligently behind the curtain to answer the running stream of questions in the chat. It's my pleasure to introduce Jessica Stevens, uh, the current executive director of HGA. Uh, yeah, Jessica, you can say hello. Hello. <laughs> and um, Anne's here as well. <laughs> okay, thank you both for being here. <laughs> Thank you all so much um, for the wonderful presentations that you have provided. Um, as Maggie noted, there have been a stream of questions in the chat. It looks like a lot of them have been answered. Um, if there are any other questions that anybody wants to uh, present at this time, we're, we're happy to entertain those. Um, I do think a couple of the presenters did have to hop off <laughs> hop off uh, for other meetings, um, but we can we can try to answer any other questions if possible at this time. All right, hearing none, we will go on ahead and end this tour. So again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to all of our presenters for the wonderful information. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out the recording of this tour uh, either later this afternoon or no later than tomorrow. Um, so be sure to, to share that on with your colleagues who weren't able to attend. But thank you all again and have a wonderful day.